Hi, good morning. <laughs> How many movements? All right. I apologize for. Um, we're an activist organization, and we're no longer allowed to use tech. So I've now made that choice, and we will never again. I'm going to bring slides and make them with the PowerPoint on my, uh, on my physical flip chart. Um, so what I've done instead is I've put them up so I can at least talk you through some of the imagery. And I'll send them to you afterwards, and you'll never look at them. Um, I'm Amelia. This is Darren. And we are really excited to be here. I've walked past this building probably 100,000 times I live in Stockwell and always wanted to break in. So thank you for inviting me so I didn't have to do that. Um, I actually wanted to start, as you will see, with Michelle, I wanted to start with something we always begin with, which is names and pronouns. So my name is Amelia. I use the pronouns she and her. Um, and as an organization, we believe very strongly in having this conversation with every room we walk into, which is that the English language is beautiful but flawed. And when I meet you, I immediately have to assume your gender. It's just the nature of the language. And so can I use you as an example? Mm -hmm. If I was to meet Darren and be like, hey, this is Darren, the next word out of my mouth would almost inevitably be he. And if I was introducing him, that would be one of the first things I would say. He is badass. <laughs> but in this instance, I don't have any idea what your gender is. And if you think about it like race, I would never assume your race. If the next thing I said was black, right? I would have no idea. And Darren would be offended because Darren is mixed race and proudly so. So I would ask. And I'm not talking to a bunch of people without personalities in, and lives, and so I hope that you won't mind if I ask you to participate. I'm Amelia, I use she, her. I'm Darren, I use he, him. I'm Rose, I use she, her. I'm Poppy, I use she, her. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, for those of you who don't know, there are many other pronouns. So there are people who are non-binary who are simply to have their names used and no pronouns at all, and so every time I refer to them, I would simply say, Darren. There are people who use pronouns like Z and here, there are plenty of others, and I know lots of people who choose to use the gender neutral they. So every time you say they, it isn't plural like they many, but plural like they, singular, went to the toilet. Um, and I wanted to make sure that you recognize that for us, this is a, a really important and very simple statement that says, in our organizations, in every room we walk into, we demand the same level of sympathy, understanding, compassion, and that means even if we're here with you, even if we're in Westminster, we ask people for their pronouns because that is the world that we want to see and we try and create it everywhere we go. So that was our welcome. Um, in terms of Michelle, you will see that we are brought here because we have this amazing partnership for the book sale, but also because, you know, <clears throat> we love Michelle. Um, <laughs> awkwardly, some might say. Inappropriately, some might say. Um, but also because we don't want to have to look to America, particularly to American, African-American women, for role models. We believe that with the phenomenal work that our young people are doing at the academy, that the next generation shouldn't have to look 5,000 miles away for someone like Michelle Obama. Um, and there are unbelievable women of color doing amazing things in this country. And so thank you for championing them all around the world. But I hope that you're publishing some of our kids and that they are the ones who are taking forward this mantle in the next generation. So um, the Advocacy Academy. The Academy is an activist training program for young people who are serious about changing the world. And Darren is going to tell you a whole bunch more, but it comes for us from a place of anger. It comes from recognizing that anger is the only response that we should have to the world as it is right now. And that anger should be passionate and it should be burning because of the experiences of so many people day to day, not just in our city, but in our country. A couple of things that piss me off and I hope will remind you that you are also angry about some stuff. I am twice as likely to be elected to parliament in Rwanda than I am to be elected to parliament in the United Kingdom. You have to earn seven times the average salary to consider buying a house in South London in the last five years. Um, no joke, even Stockwell. Um, there are a thousand knife attacks in this city every single month and we lost five boys from South London in 12 days. We have uh, an amazing situation right now where 15% of all young people are on free school meals. Only 2% of them go on to the best universities. It has nothing to do with how talented they are and how much potential they have. If you're Afro-Caribbean, you are four times as likely to be unemployed in Lambeth. And if you're Afro-Caribbean and 18, you are twice as likely to be unemployed as your white friend, same grades, same school, the day you leave high school. 
One of the ones that I find most difficult is that one in 12 young people feel so unsupported that they physically self-harm or attempt suicide before the age of 18. And then 14-6. All of you will know 14-6. Last year on the 14th of the 6th, 72 people burned to death in their houses because their lives were simply not valued as much as the people who lived opposite them. That's the world that we live in. Most of the people in this room don't experience that every day, but that is the world that we live in. And the academy recognizes that for most of their lives, the young people who are living this every day have had zero power to change it and been told not just that they have no power, but that it's their fault. That somehow those that succeed do so because they are better and those that don't do so because they are not. And I believe very strongly that we need a movement of young people, not a couple, all, to say, this is not the world that we will inherit. We will fix it. So, Darren, you want to tell us a little bit about what it looks like for you to be angry? Definitely. OK. <laughs> uh, before I start, um, I'm going to open up with um, a spoken word piece that I wrote um, whilst I was on Advocacy Academy. Uh, it's called No Limitations. So people see a mystery sky with a slit in his eye. Obviously means he's about to commit a crime. But what if that crime was to inspire the next generation? To make them feel like they have no limitations, whether they are mixed, black, Latino or Asian. Then yeah, I hope I can commit many crimes and change our nation. Because my identity is more than my appearance. And just because you're white shouldn't mean that you get clearance while the black kids get stopped and searched. But please fuel our perseverance and continue to strive for our goals. In a world where the lighter we are means the brighter we are. Where being a minority means we have no say and must do the jobs that have the lowest pay. Where being a girl means you should have no flaws and should look just like the Photoshop models on billboards time for us all to say no more. Students only make up 20% of the population, but we are 100% of the future generation. We should be taught that our identity is more than skin deep or what we wear and what people think, because everyone's identity is unique and it's really the values we hold deep that makes us the individuals we want people to see, not our hoodies or the way that we speak. So next time you see a six foot one guy, slit eye, big build from Brixton, don't instantly think he's going to prison because he could have a vision to become the next politician to bring an end to sexism, racism and every type of ism that creates a system of oppression and division. Because a section of our population are being in prison just for being born different than the standard tradition. Change may very well be the motive. I guess it's our turn to go out there and show them. Thank you. So. <clears throat> so by all accounts, I shouldn't be standing here today. Parents who are drug abusers, council state upbringing, 22, currently in college. I wasn't meant to meet the publishers in, at, at Penguin. In one way or another, all my life I've been told that I don't matter, that my voice doesn't count, that I'm defined by my disadvantage, born with a black mark, and sometimes I believe them. I first remember being called a chav when I was six. A group of men, white and middle class, took one look at me and spat out that word like it was my name. Society will remain broken until we learn to look beneath the surface. We see a tracksuit, a skin colour, a hijab, and that's all we need to know. But we know nothing. Chav, council house and violent. Moreland's estate may be my home, but they didn't know my circumstances. They didn't know if I was stupid or if I did well at school. They didn't know if I ever started a fight or if I was too busy looking after my nan. When things were really bad at home, I'd go sit in a community centre. I was five or six and staying out past midnight, and there were gangs there. But rather than trying to recruit me, they gave me money to buy chicken and chips and sat with me to make sure I was safe. I could have risen to it and dropped my aspirations, but I was determined to defy, to defy everyone's expectation of me and people like me. I worked hard in school and set my sights on Parliament, despite not knowing anyone's side. Parliament, the place, for, the place to fight for inequality, right? Except that a huge number of our MPs grew up privileged, much more privileged than the majority of people they represent. The likelihood of a poor black kid becoming the next prime minister is one in 17 million. But if you're a white, privately educated boy, it's just one in 200,000. And the top six private colleges in the UK send the same amount of people to Oxbridge as over 1,000 state colleges together. But I'm still going to try. Because if I try, then another Mitchell kid growing up or more into state might think that he can too. The more of us that stand up, that stay standing, even when we're laughed at, the more, the more society will begin to accept 
that a young person of colour is a crucial part of the democratic story of this country, tracks it and all, whether they like it or not. I became governor of Richmond College and spent time with Helen Hayes in her parliamentary office. And then I thought, where now? How does an 18-year-old kid with no political connections break into this world? And that's where the Advocacy Academy came in. I get to meet the kinds of people that seem completely out of reach, like all of you. The people who published the books that, that inspire me to write, like Noughts and Crosses. I got, I got to have discussions I've always wished we had in school and take action on issues that directly affect my life. It's a place where I feel my, like my background plays no role in what I can become. A place where everyone, experts and participants, are equal in the fight for a better world. And it allowed me to learn how to run and win the first youth-led community housing campaign in the UK. By 2020, I would have helped build 25 genuinely and permanently affordable homes in Streatham for families like mine. Last week, I was elected as youth rep for the Labour Party. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's just the first step, but it's also just the beginning. Helen Keller once asked, what would, be more, what, would be, what would be worse than being born with no sight? Her answer, it would have been so much worse to be born with no vision. I wasn't born blind, but I was born a poor mixed race kid in central London. Still, I'll take that any day because it gives me the vision I need to change my neighborhood and one day maybe even my world. Because whatever you're fighting against, racism or poverty, sexism, homophobia, or any type of hate, just remember that you are a crucial part of creating a new world and keep believing and striving, change is gonna come. Thank you. Thanks. The Advocacy Academy is about stories. The stories that make us who we are. It's about using these stories to make change, to break chains, and take, taking a group of young people, all angry, all opinionated, all of whom have been through way more than they should have by the age of 17, and creating a family. We are a movement of young people who are ready to trans transform the world. A six-month social justice fellowship which trains us to tackle the biggest challenges in the 21st century, from housing to immigration to mental health. In total, we spend more than 300 hours learning and acting, acting together, but the Advocacy Academy is a home for life. It's just, it's just the first 10 days I probably learned more than I did in the last five years of education. The things I will use for the rest of my life. The Advocacy Academy isn't talk. We do not want your pity or charity. We want you to respect us, to treat, to treat us as your equals. We do not need you to save us. We are here to save you. Thank you. Um, Darren, and it's his birthday today. <laughs> 22. Um, when we first met, <laughs> I think that the idea that you would be standing here and doing that is um, no. pretty incredible. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, the Academy is... It's like not a really an organization. I wish it were. I wish I'd sat down and was like, you know, we should start as an organization. Um, I moved to Stockwell and I recognized that um, this didn't exist in this country. There weren't activist training programs. There weren't youth movements. There wasn't an opportunity for people to win serious change. And I thought every movement I've ever been inspired by was run by young people. I mean, every single one whether it was SNCC in California getting Voting Rights Act passed, whether it was the suffragettes here in the East End who were run by 17-year-olds. I mean, the reality is that that's who made the world that we're living in. And we've depoliticized every single young person. We were terrified by the idea that we might say to kids, you have power and you can use it. And don't worry, you can make the mistakes when you're 17 that you want to make when you're 70, because actually, get them over and done with, learn something. And it does freak me out a little bit that we are trying to sanitize young people who are literally living this every single day. I mean, they experience these things in their lives and we tell them that it's not appropriate, they're not ready to challenge them. That is the sense of powerlessness that will leave you unable to play a part in your democracy later on. It will leave you alienated and angry. So we have a, a policy, which is trust them, help them and trust them, and they will do the things they need to do for themselves. Um, a couple of images up here I wanted to include because we don't pitch. We come and we try and challenge a 
slightly disrupt, a little bit of agitation. And one of the big philosophies of the academy is the idea that meritocracy is a lie. So you'll see up here two core images. One is of a race. Uh, in this particular image, it is of a white middle-aged man, slightly balding, nice suit, um, and a woman of color who are both running a race to get to the same place, but they fundamentally face different challenges. And the idea that somehow we are not living in that society is a falsehood. And the idea that somehow the reality of each individual struggling personally with things, with loss and with health and with the realities of being a human being and struggling structurally with things where you face systemic oppression on a daily basis because you are a person of color, because you are disabled, because you are LGBT, they are not the same thing. So yes, everyone has struggles, but not everyone has a struggle simply because they assign themselves to a particular group of identity. And that, that for us is the core. We work with people who are structurally oppressed and we teach them to dismantle the systems that oppress them. So crucially, we're not pro-food banks. We don't think that this is about social action and volunteering. We are not training Darren to go out into the community and do something that then his kids and their kids will have to do again. This is about really fixing the issues that bind us into the systems that we are part of. The other image you will see, and this is this one right here, um, is of three shapes. In this instance, we have a triangle and a square, and I have no idea, but I'm gonna go with a pentagon. <laughs> I'm trying to get through this particularly small circle. And it says, I don't know what you guys are complaining about. If you wanna make it through, just be yourself from the circle on the other side. Um, in a lot of our schools today, and Darren will attest to this, I walk in and I talk to head teachers and I talk to a lot of very, very well-meaning educators who say, just shave off your sides and you'll make it through. Change your accent, act differently, have separate interests to the ones that really are yours. Be a little bit less of or a little bit more of something. I am not pro everyone trying to fit into the status quo. If that worked, then A, the people who have had power for a thousand years would have already fixed the problems. They can't, they don't know how. But B, our world is not meant to be one shape, one color, one size. So I'm here to say, and I think this is something that will fall on pretty positive ears in this building, people should be able to succeed as they are from where they are and they shouldn't have to change themselves to do so. And you know, now we'll just have no tech at all. Because <laughs> um, I think that's where we're going anyway. Um, but I think it's really important that the message of the Academy is be more of yourself, be the best version of yourself and demand that the world fits around you because that is what justice looks like. I'm now gonna go and touch the, the screen. <laughs> just talk amongst yourselves. This is, mm, no, mm -mm. That's, that's beyond me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, what you will see also, is that we have a very deliberate recruitment strategy. So if there was unlimited amounts of money in the world, we would work with everyone. But the reality is if people start like this and you give everyone equal investment, this is what happens. So we deliberately target young people who are middle attainers, people who have amazing leadership experience, but who are overlooked because they're not hugely academic. And in our schools, those two things are correlated. All the time we're told that people who are academic are also the best leaders. We know that's not true. We know the kid in the class who's acting up is often the one that the people listen to the most in the class. And so we look for the kids who, maybe academics weren't their thing. Kind of. <laughs> or maybe, actually, they're incredibly brilliant and suffer mental health issues. The truth is, those kids that we want are the ones who are going to lead and gonna be listened to. And so we find them, we train them, and we make them exceptional. Um, We've talked about structural change, so I'm gonna move on and I'm gonna move down because that's what we're going for now. Okay, a couple more pictures for you. Um, I was once told this is the solution to homelessness. Um, the reality is that all the campaigns that we teach young people to run are the ones that will take 20 years to win, not the ones that will take two. And so we don't look like a normal organization because we don't spend our lives putting all of our successes on Facebook because the truth is we are fighting much longer battles. How long has that housing campaign been going on? Uh, like three years. Yeah, three years. three years and we just got a site. So we are long term, we are doing real activist work. And if you talk to our people in our networks like Sisters Uncut and Black Lives Matter, they will tell you they don't need quick wins. They need real entrenched support. And that's the kind of young people we're trying to train. The ones who have the stamina for these campaigns. My background is in politics. I came up through American and British politics. And I can tell you that 
Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the DREAM Act, the stuff that I was working on in the States. 20 years, 30 years activists have been fighting for the same piece of legislation. That is what it looks like to win. And that's the kind of young people we're training. If you can read this, you may recognize it. Um, this is very much the philosophy of the academy. It says, when I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. And when I ask why the poor have no food, they call me a communist. Mm. The reality is that we encourage you to be called names. The more names you're called, the more work you're doing. So feel free to make some enemies in doing this work. And I think that as a, a, an incredible organization, you publish books that people weren't ready for. And I think that they grew into them because you agitated the readership. And so I encourage you, as you have been for so many years, uh, to do what we ask these young people to do, which is be brave and take criticism and wear proudly the labels that you're given because one day they will be the badges of honor that you have. Um, you will see here on the top right, for you, yeah, top right hand side, um, an image of the kind of world we're trying to create. So we talk with these amazing young people uh, about the world as it should be. And we talk about why equality is not something that we fight for. At the Academy, we believe equity is reasonable, saying who needs more and how can we get it for them? But that liberation is what we're working towards, the dismantling of any of those oppressions that exist in the first place. And that's because if you're drowning, being pulled out and saved doesn't remove the trauma of having been drowning. But having never drowned in the first place, that is a nice life to live. So the Academy is trying to work towards that world without any kind of box, any kind of, in this instance, fence. But there is actually a fourth box to this image. And it's one that we leave blank. And we ask the people in the audience to question for themselves what that world looks like. We talked about this earlier. And for Darren, it's not having people who are spectators, recognizing that actually they should be either at least in the stands or preferably on the team. And I think asking for ourselves, what are we trying to build? What does that world look like? And how do we get there is very much what we ask 16, 17 year olds to do so that they don't compromise on the values that they hold before the fact they get out of university. I mean, that is so often what we see is that by the time people are 21, they're not voting, they're not engaged, but more importantly, they do not believe there is hope for the future. So a few things to end with. We want to show you some of the campaigns that we run so that you get a better sense of both what we do, but also how we're using media and communications in the 21st century because we've never written a press release. Um, that is the reality of trying to campaign with young people is you don't need to. So I picked um, four specific campaigns that we've run. Uh, the first was very early days. It was in our second year and it was trying to talk about anti-Muslim hate in the media. We have a campaign that specifically targeted the Sun and the Daily Mail which was a choice, um, because we had a group of young British Muslims on our program who were experiencing an incredible rate of anti-Muslim hate. And unfortunately, they felt like nobody was trying from within the, the right-wing media to challenge the kind of headlines that were being seen. And they wanted to go right to the source and have the conversation. They thought it would be interesting to hold tension with the editor. So I'm going to play you the video that they made outside of a mosque in South London, um, which ended up with half a million views and a very interesting meeting with the editor of The Sun. To Mr. Gallagher, the editor of The Sun. And Mr. Dekar, editor of The Daily Mail. Assalamu alaikum. We are young British Muslims. And like so many of our friends and family, we have experienced Islamophobia. And that's not a word we use lightly. But it's the most accurate description of the hate that some of our fellow Londoners have hurled at us in the street. In this increasingly polarised society, more and more people are being targeted for their beliefs. Too many of our neighbours hold major misconceptions about Islam. Most of which originates in our media. They struggle to see past our hijab. Or our khamis. To the person underneath. If not set right. These dangerous stereotypes lead to othering and scapegoating of minority communities. Time and again history shows us that takes us nowhere good. We believe the only way to alter the divisive direction we are heading is by talking to one another. We must seek out the people who understand us the least and listen to each other's honest concerns. Just because we disagree does not mean we must become enemies. We truly believe that Britain is big enough for all of us and made great by all our different identities. As the editors of the UK's two best-selling newspapers, you hold incredible power. As Spider-Man has taught us, with great power comes great responsibility. A responsibility you forfeit when you print headlines like Muslim gang jail for kidnapping or raping two girls as part of their Eid celebrations. And one in five Brit Muslims sympathy for jihadis. Really? 
Your newspapers reach millions of people. The language you use to write about Muslims directly impacts the way people talk about and treat my community. We take our free press very seriously. But we do also believe in fair press. People's lives are at stake. That's why we are asking you, human to human, to spend one hour this winter talking with a group of young Muslims. We want to tell you our story of growing up in the UK and to hear yours. We know we'll have a lot more in common than that which divides us. So, when works for you? So, you might be thinking, that is the worst power analysis in all history. But actually, we sat down, this is where I like, can I use the internet? We sat down and we had a conversation about what the hell these young people were actually able to influence, recognizing that they weren't buyers of the newspaper. And we realized that, they, that the editor of The Sun had never sat down with a Muslim group before. They'd never had a conversation with a group of Muslims. And they said, you know what? The best thing that we can do is use shame. It's the best tool we have because actually he's the one that has to sign the headlines off. And so they got in the room and they agreed to a closed door Chatham House meeting for an hour, which turned into three, and they brought 10 young British Muslims. And I kid you not, they employed the school of guilt like I've never seen it. I mean, they sat, they cried, like they did whatever they could because they wanted to be able to look this man in the eyes and say, this is your choice and you are making this decision. And while most of our campaigns are actually about long-term impact and measuring the ability to say this headline hasn't existed since, in that moment, they knew they had no power. They were coming from a place of very little institutional backing. And so they used emotion and it worked. And what's really interesting about it is that before, the, this, this, this is an amazing truth, but before they printed a particular headline two weeks later, they, he phoned them up and asked them to sense check the headline. Then he left the newspaper, which is really shit. Um, but that was the first campaign that, we, that went properly viral. And it went so because it was shared by young Muslims on Snapchat. So that was the first. Um, the second of the campaigns, which you may or may not have it. This is, this is like the lifelong challenge, right? Um, I don't know if you've seen this. So Legally Black, do you recognize this one? Yeah. Hey, awesome. Um, Legally Black by uh, Shaden, Kofi, Bell, and Liv, um, who are all 16, 17 year old young kids of color. Um, their frustration, very much like Darren's actually, uh, was the nature of stereotyping and representation. Um, and now things are changing, thank goodness. But two and a half years ago, they were just bored. They were bored of having to watch dear white people in America. They wanted to watch something that represented their community. Um, and the idea for the posters came about because they wanted to be on posters. That's what happened. Um, which is the best motivation, I think, for any young person is I want to be on a poster. Um, and James Bond is Shaden's dad. And um, it's just, like that was how it worked. And, and it worked. And the reason that it worked is because it was shared by a bunch of young people who did things for themselves. So the narrative that I often give our young people is, I can't get away with this, right? If I had done this, nobody would give two shits. The truth is that the people are as important as the action. So this one went everywhere. It was on 75 news sources internationally. Ashton Kutcher wrote about it. I mean, why? <laughs> but the thing that was really fantastic about it is it got them in the room. The aim of the campaign was to get in the room with Channel 4 to have a conversation about creating the first young black British drama. Um, they've now created a Channel 4 Black History Month set of these posters and they are having an ongoing argument about what young means because young is not 30, young is 17. Um, and they keep creating really great content for me. And the kids are like, this is boring. <laughs> so <laughs> they're trying to make them understand that we're looking for a skins that is more realistic for young people of color. Um, and that's where they're currently at with it. And it's, it's been an amazing campaign because it has, for the first time, launched a group of 17-year-olds onto the map as activists. Um, so that was really cool. The last thing that I think is kind of interesting, I hope you will think is kind of interesting, is this one. Most tangible result, as Darren was saying, that we've ever had. Um, Darren, what is a community land trust? OK, all right. So basically, uh, community land trust um, is a uh, generally and permanently affordable housing. So um, the way how we keep it affordable is that the, um, uh, it's based on the local income of the area. 
So for Lambeth, the local income is £30,000. So if you're earning £30,000, you can afford to buy one of these properties. And then if you go on to sell it, you have to sell it at the rate of the local income, which keeps it always affordable instead of skyrocket prices. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> um, CLTs. Uh, takes the housing out of the market, similarly to how we took people out of the market when we ended slavery and said, guess what, you shouldn't be able to buy everything at market price. Housing, similarly, it should be attached to income. So it's been a long battle. Sadiq has finally given us a 3.2 million pound piece of land and there will be 25 houses on it, 25 family houses on it, uh, and it will be the first youth-led campaign in the country. So why these campaigns? Because actually, <laughs> this is the stuff that pissed you off. And there are lots of things I care about, they don't care about. Um, and there are things I'm like, really? But actually, the truth is that the academy is about power. And power comes from passion, purpose, and personal experience. So that is where these campaigns come from. And every year we'll have different ones. And there are a bunch up here that aren't, uh, the bunch that aren't mentioned up here, like a Latin American campaign to finally get a box recognizing Latin Americans on UCAS forms. We have an amazing campaign to get in the centerfold of GQ a conversation about racialized fetishization of women, because still saying that's not my type is an acceptable thing. Um, there are a bunch of things that are happening that are probably the more radical side of campaigning in this country being run by a bunch of 17 year olds. The thing I wanted to end with is actually a bit of the vision. Um, I have a two minute video and then I will let you go to your jobs because you're being employed to do things. Um, we sat down, it was our fifth birthday in February, terrifying. Um, we sat down six months ago and had a conversation about the fact that we have no strategy, no plan and no idea what we're doing. Um, and that was because, in part, the vision has always been massive. It's been, we want a million kids who are able to make change. We want to see movements that are absolutely revolutionary coming out of South London. We want a proper transformation of the way that politics looks in this country. But to do that, we need to start changing the landscape of how you engage in justice. The way to do that is to have a physical presence. If you're a young person right now on a Thursday night and you're in central Brixton, there is literally nowhere for you to sit but what? McDonald's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. like, there is nowhere for you to be. And if you go to the community centers, there's nothing for you to do unless you want to play foosball, right? There's nothing to challenge you and grow you. And so we have taken over a derelict building in central Brixton. If any of you are from there, it's just behind Dogstar. It's on the road just behind Dogstar. It used to be Fujiyama Restaurant. Um, convinced a billionaire who owns the Trocadero to give it to us for five years. And we are turning it into the first campus for young activism in the country. Uh, and the idea is that people will show up and they will have every night of the week and every day of the week and every day on the weekend and all half terms, we will have every kind of organizing training, power building, like action-based work in this country. And that means that, yeah, they can show up and join Black Lives Matter in that building, but it also means that if they're a kid in care, they can come and spend two days locked in our building, train on how to have their voices heard within the care system. Everything and anything that is required to make serious change in this country. So this is the, it doesn't have an electricity. Basically the building is a shell. <laughs> um, and so we were like, hmm, we need electricity also. Uh, it's illegal, but that seems to be a theme. Um, so we thought we would show you the video. This was written by Darren. Um, it is, it is our new project, and it is the thing that we are excited about. For too long, we've lived with postcode luck. Doors slammed, centers closed, and told to shut up. Told from young that we're criminals for being black and full of life. Terrorists for putting our heads to the earth. Foreigners for seeking sanctuary on new turf. And though these streets don't feel like home no more, we owe it to our core to start this uproar, lock arms, open minds, and knock down doors. We are more than just a label, bigger than any box, and we will not be inheriting this mess. We will be fixing it. The Advocacy Academy is the bridge between the fire within us and the change we want to see. And change is exactly what we have achieved. Five years of organising, lobbying and taking to the streets for better black representation, homes that stay affordable for generations and an end to sexual violence in our nation. And this ain't even all of it, because our potential is infinite. In Borough Broken South London, anger shows, passion flows, and power grows. But now our advocacy needs a home. 
This building will be a space that will give voice to the voiceless and will leave you grown folks speechless because we will show you what it means to act more and speak less. This building will be ours, the first ever campus for young activists. We know that even something, someone, that's falling apart can be built back better with a little bit of love. This building will be the beginning because justice happens when someone a bit like me and someone a bit like you sit in a room a bit like this and decide that things are going to be different. But we can't do it alone. So leave your creps at the door and lay down the world's burdens. This is your blank slate. Place to create. Safe space. Home. Thanks, guys. So basically, oh. that's the academy. Um, we're, we're so excited to be partnered with you, and we would love to have you come visit. Thank you very much for having us this morning and for spending so long. And seriously, come hang out with us because every person that shows up pretty much makes the family. And it would be really cool to have you. Thank you. Thank you.